and I look forward to hearing your various uh, contributions. Uh, as you all note, all Cabinet have their uh, names in front of them, so you'll know who might be addressing you. Um, and uh, so there's a couple of things I ought to, to remind you of. Um, that this cabinet is being filmed, and not only is it being filmed uh, in its normal way, it is also now uh, being well. It now be available on YouTube. We have we now have our own channel, Bath and North East Somerset. So it's, it's prob probably quite exciting. Um, so the images and sound recording uh, may be used for training purposes within the council, um, and obviously, if you do not wish to be filmed, uh, then could you just let uh, the camera operators know. Okay, uh, I'd now like to ask uh, Jack to uh, tell us what to do in the event of an emergency. Thank you, Madam Chairman. If the continuous alarm sounds, you must evacuate the building and proceed to the assembly point. From this room, you follow the green running person signs to the exit using either the marble staircase at the end of the building nearest to Bath Abbey or the main staircase. Please do not use the lifts. The assembly point for this building is at the Orange Grove grass area opposite Bath Abbey. There is an evacuation chair for use by disabled people who service in the corridor outside the council chamber public gallery. Alternatively, at the, area, the area at the top of the marble staircase has been designated as a safe refuge where persons needing assistance should assemble. Thank you. Um, so, moving through the next agenda item, which is apologies for absence. I do not believe that I have received any, and I do not believe that anybody has declared uh, or made a declaration of interest. Um, item 19 is any urgent business, and there is none that has been agreed by myself. So, item 20, which is questions from the public and from councillors. So, there are 14 questions, and I will now go through those and see... Um, if there are any supplementaries. Um, so the first question is from uh, Councillor Vic Pritchard. Oh, there you are. Um, do you have a supplementary question? No, I have no supplementary question, but thank you for the answer, and I look forward to seeing what, um, what is, is actually being determined as the way forward. Okay. Uh, and then uh, question two, Councillor Paul Myers of Councillor Paul Crosley. Do you have any? Okay. Uh, question three, uh, Councillor Paul Myers of Richard Samuel. No supplementaries. Uh, question four from Karen Walker. No, she's not here. Um, and back to you, Vic. Question five. Do you have a supplementary question? Uh, question six, Councillor Brian Simmons of Tim Ball. Yes, he is, it's there. Uh, Councillor Paul Myers, this is question seven. Do you have a supplementary of, uh, of Councillor Crosley? And question eight from Councillor Simmons. Um, do you have a supplementary for this question? Okay. Thank you. Uh, and obviously we have uh, some questions that have been asked of from the public, uh, but they do not have the, the right to ask a supplementary. So we now move on to um, item 21, which is statements, deputations or petitions for the public or from councillors. Uh, so I would like to ask Robin if you'd like to make um, the first statement. Sorry, Robin Kerr. Thank you very much, indeed, Leader, uh, and uh, good evening, Cabinet members. I read with interest uh, the feedback uh, from your corporate peer challenge last July, which you, uh, I believe you're going to discuss later. I note uh, two of its recommendations. Firstly, development of a vision and plan for Bath. I welcome this and offer the help of FOBRA in drafting it, but I remember several attempts to do this in the past, none of which seem to survive. But there we go. Let's hope we can make one that, uh, that really works and continues and exists in the future. 
Secondly, a review of governance arrangements. The report points out that the lack of parish councils in the city has implications for community governance. It goes on to praise the Bar City Forum. Though all of this seems to have been omitted from the chapter on engagement with communities, but I think that must be an editing problem. I am a founder and co-opted <coughs> member of the City Forum and therefore encourage you to drive its reform or replacement with energy and dispatch, as I know you intend to do. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Robin. Does Cabinet have any questions that they'd like to ask? No? In that case, then, I welcome your willingness, as ever, Robin, to get involved. Would you please excuse me, Chairman? I no. have no chat over me. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Uh, the second um, statement, I believe, is coming from Councillor Sean Hughes. Oh, there you are. Yeah. Sorry, I've, I've given you a copy of a document. Um, no, I believe I've only got three minutes, and I've never done anything in three minutes in my life, so I'll give this a try. So for those of you who don't know me, my name's Sean Hughes. I'm a councillor in Midsummer Norton. And for those of you who don't know Midsummer Norton, we're 10 miles south of here. We are um, the largest population in Baines, uh, outside of the city of Bath, with a population of about 21,000 and increasing. A high number of people from Midsummer Norton commutes to Bath on a daily basis. That number is increasing uh, due to the increase in housing in Midsummer Norton and the fact that we're becoming a commuter sound because we're a very attractive uh, proposition for house prices. Unlike Canesham, we don't have a train service in Midsummer Norton, so we're very reliant on the road systems and cars. So since becoming a councillor, I've been looking into the issue of the climate emergency and looking into if I had to commute to Bath on a daily basis, how would I actually do that? Now, I live uh, about 10 minutes away from the Mid Midsummer Norton High Street, where the buses leave from. So my answer should be, I'll walk out of my house to the high street, get on a bus to Bath. The reality is that I'm probably not going to do that. The reality is I'll probably walk out of my front door get in the car, drive to Odd Down, park at the park and ride, or maybe even just carry on down the hill into Bath and park in the centre. So the problem is how do you deal with that in initial engagement from the front door to the public transport? Um, we have a great cycle network in Midsummer and Autumn, but it, it's used for recreation because we can't actually commute very far on it. So my solution is uh, a park and ride. Now the park and ride I'm proposing would be located uh, centrally between Midsummer Norton, Radstock and Westfield on a piece of effectively industrial wasteland. Uh, the, um, the idea would be a park and ride with an express bus from the park and ride directly into the centre of Bath, so you can park and ride into the, uh, the bus into Bath. The cycle routes are, all converge at this point, so the cycle routes run from Midsummer Norton to the park and ride, from Madstock and from Westfield. Roughly about a, a mile radius would, would, inca would, would capture most of that, that area. Uh, the area could also, so you could cycle to the park and ride, um, you could also use the car park as a car share, um, so people could, could meet there. Sorry, am I going to run out of time? You have just run out of time. Do you want to have you got one last sentence to wrap that up? Okay. Well, you have the proposal. Um, hopefully, we can have an opportunity to, to meet with cabinet members. I've already, and I've already met with, with two of you um, to discuss and see if we can push it forward. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your uh, for your statement, for your proposal, and um, I. Unless there are any particular questions, sorry, Councillor Butters. Thank you, Chair. As Councillor Hughes said, we have had a, a meeting which was uh, very interesting, and we thank you for your uh, work in this area. And we'll get back to you as soon as we can. Thank you.
So as, uh, as uh, Councillor Butters has indicated, you know, we'll obviously be referring this proposal to the Cabinet members uh, for, for further discussion in due course. So thank you. My third speaker is uh, Councillor Sarah Moore. Thank you. I want to talk to the administration this evening about the purpose-built student accommodation blocks in the city of Bath. Purpose-built student accommodation was first seen as a solution to the proliferation of houses in multiple occupation, but this has proved not to have brought any relief to this market in Bath. In fact, the rapid spread of purpose-built student accommodation that is actually more expensive than HMOs to stay in is off-putting to many residents, uh, many students, and itself has started to become a problem. It seems that purpose-built student accommodation is seen as an easy way to create a revenue for a developer, and many are, being, are putting in planning applications that are speculating in a market that is becoming very overcrowded. A number of current blocks have been struggling to fill the rooms they have and are now resorting to letting them out as Airbnbs. The cost to much-needed social housing is being put in jeopardy as the price of available land is also being pushed up. The Council needs to be able to control the amount of future purpose-built student accommodation by ensuring that the evidence is provided that the development is actually needed and to reduce the speculation that seems to be in the market today. I would ask that the Council would work with the universities and developers to ensure that students are not overcharged for accommodation and that any new purpose-built student accommodation is actually needed and supported by the universities before the Council could even consider any approval. This together with adequate infrastructure being put in place where blocks are being proposed is essential. Please can you take action now as I believe it is really starting to get out of control. Thank you. Thank, for your, thank you for your statement, Sarah. Um, Councillor Ball, do you have uh, any comments? Yes, can I thank you for the report this evening. Would you be pleased to hear we are looking at these situations through local plan and possible <coughs> supplementary plan documents? You can answer that. <laughs> Let's just say thank you. <laughs> Can you repeat it? Sorry, Tim, I couldn't hear you. Yes, and would you be pleased to hear that we are looking at the situation for local plan development and also any possible supplementary planning documents to actually regulate the situation? That would be really useful if that can all come into there. Um, the sooner the better, because as you know, we've got quite a few applications coming, so if we can get it rolled out into a local plan would be appreciated. Thank you. And then our last speaker is Councillor Jackson. Thank you. We, the undersigned residents of Bath and North East Somerset, petition the Cabinet to reconsider the decision to dispose of the family silver, i.e. 11 children's community playgrounds. These well-loved, much-used areas are essential to young people's mental health and physical well-being, and the creation of a community spirit, both both in long-established villages and new estates. The safety and security of children is our highest priority, and we expect the professional standards of care and maintenance to be retained. These are the words of a petition gathering signatures in my area. Even in the pouring rain last weekend, Bain's residents of all political persuasions in Mitsum and Orton were eagerly signing it, and that for two reasons. Firstly, as any seasoned campaigner in the Soma Valley knows, for the local community, it is children and young people who matter most. If the opportunities for outdoor play are reduced, the likelihood of their health problems increases, not to mention that of their parents and grandparents having to deal with all their pent-up energy. Secondly, they pay their council tax, and along with grip bins, rubbish collections and recycling, they expect the council to deliver for the welfare of their children. Where the play equipment has been provided by their own fundraising, as in the case of Collier's Way Hayden, or from Section 106 money covered by the developers' sales of overpriced houses to them, they are the more offended. We have seen a continual progress, uh, process in Baines since 2000 of outsourcing. First it was council housing to what is now Curo. 
Then it was recycling, which was such a disaster it had to be brought back in-house. Home care and other community medical services went the same way. Parish councils are increasingly expected to take up the burden and raise presets, which residents see as double taxation. Now it is parks and play areas. What all these areas have in common is the lack of transparency. Residents are told what will happen, they are not properly consulted, and scrutiny processes have been cut to the bone so that challenge is virtually impossible. Recently, I had a holiday staying in Avila, which is where this coal came from, Valladolid and Salamanca in Spain. I could not believe how clean everywhere was, except for the cigarette ends, and what beautiful parks and green spaces there were. I was told that the town council precept covers 50% uh, of it is devoted to parks and cleansing. We are told that the problem here is adult social care. Could it possibly be that Spanish children, and indeed adults, get so much fresh air and exercise in their play areas that the old people need less care because they are healthier than us? I only ask. Eleanor, how do you do that? That was almost exactly three minutes. And despite your, your voice, and I'm sorry to hear that you're not well. Um, Councillor Crossley, do you have some questions or points you wanted to make? Uh, no, I have no questions, but I do have some points to make. First of all, 11 ch children play areas that are not being closed. Some of them are being repurposed. We are looking to move towards imaginative play, uh, which is a different form of play from just having a, uh, a couple of swings. Uh, and that, that has been proved around the country where imaginative play has come in, that you get more children playing for longer and uh, with, with a, a, a range of children. When you look at what we're doing, uh, we are putting in new play equipment uh, across the authority area, including uh, we're bringing in the first uh, disabled wheelchair-friendly uh, uh, roundabout, which I think when that goes in will be a, a big hit and will become actually an attraction for people from a very wide area. So we are putting in uh, a lot of stuff. Uh, we are looking to work with, it is correct that we are looking in some instances to work uh, with parish and town councils, uh, and uh, we are uh, committed to play, and to that end, not only are we putting in the disabled wheelchair, but we have been refurbishing uh, a number of uh, play areas across the authority area as well. So I think uh, what... Uh, Eleanor said, which she knows about campaigning. I think really when she does start campaigning, uh, she should get the words of her petitions to reflect what's actually happening on the ground and then challenge on that place. And there's been plenty of opportunity to challenge. None of this has been done secretly, as she implied. There's been a consultation with a wide range of people, a number of letters delivered, and we are uh, considering it. And as of yet, uh, decisions have not yet been made. I wonder, Councillor Jackson, if you are aware that um, the Council is, um, and Councillor Crossley and myself have approved this, spending £325,000 this year on improvements of play facilities within Bath North East Somerset. And that, is, that money has been approved and will be spent this financial year. Yes, as long as it's not three minutes worth. Quite simply. What I said was what residents think, and that is what matters. And they are not aware of this sum being spent or of uh, Councillor Crossley's plans. So, if I might say so, perhaps um, the recommendations of the LEA, LGA report should be taken on board, better communication with residents, because they are not aware of it. Your points are duly noted, Councillor Jackson. Would you like to present the petition? So, moving on, we now are on item 8, which is the minutes of the, the meeting of the 12th of September. Um, does anybody have any issues with these minutes? Anybody wish to second the minutes as an accurate record? In which case, then, I shall sign them. OK. Uh, sorry, all those in, in favour of that, then I'll sign them. 
Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, item nine is the consideration of uh, single member items. Um, I think we just need to note that. Uh, then, consideration of matters uh, from PDS. There is nothing. Um, and uh, recent single member decisions taken. So, we just need to, to note that report. Do we need to vote on noting? No. Okay. Not on this instance. Um, okay, so item 12 is the revenue and capital budget monitoring uh, report, and I now hand over to Councillor Samuel. Thank, Thank you. you. Sorry, I very nearly forgot to ask. Are there any ad hoc contributions? Okay, in which case, Richard, you are free to propose. Thank you, Chair. Um, well, members of the Cabinet, I'm pleased to report that the projected revenue budget outturn for 2019-20 is currently forecast to be 0.08 underspend, uh, and that is a, a big change from the last quarter report you received. Now, that is due in the main to well-timed reductions in capital financing charges of 2.5 million arising from capital reprofiling from our capital program into later years and from loan interest changes from higher to lower interest rates on our investments. Um, lower to higher. Uh, however, I must issue a word of caution here as the Council's underlying position is of concern to me. In particular, adverse movements in children's services expenditure, reductions in parking income, and unachieved or unachievable savings, uh, although some of these increases are offset by improved heritage services income. I'll return to each of these shortly. So first, the underlying position in children's services. Expenditure has run above income in each of the last four years, and the budget has moved from 22.8 million four years ago to 30.4 million currently. And that represents an increase of 33% over those four years. Currently, despite, re despite rebasing the budget, the budget is expected to overspend against the approved budget by 1.9 million this year. This is all set out in the report. Now, the reasons behind this are complex and are driven in part by underfunded central government decisions, but there is no doubt that an enormous strain is currently being placed on the budgets for this service, and as a result, on that of the whole council, by the consistent underfunding of local council children's services by the Conservative government. Yeah. Further pressures in Should children... Can I ask a, a question? Well, I'd rather... We're, I, in Perda. Is it correct we're not in no, Perda at the moment. We're, we'll be, Perda will start at the end of this meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, further pressures in children's services also exist in SEN provision, and these are set out in the report. I won't go into those. Parking services income has also dropped by a projected £621,000. The largest drop is nearly £300,000 at Charlotte Street car park, followed by £110,000 at other car parks, and a drop of £117,000 for on-street um, on car parking, together with a reduction of £300,000 in pen penalty charge income. Now, on one level, this may indicate that the policies to discourage car usage are working, but it must be acknowledged that pressure is being placed on council finances, and less is available to invest in transport improvements as a result. I am concerned that parking infringement income is falling, and I would like the reasons for this investigated more fully, but I believe that pricing decisions taken in the past are at least in part responsible for these reductions, because we are seeing a considerable reduction in usage, particularly in Charlotte Street, and I think that is partly related to the pricing decisions taken before. 
I would like to highlight the continuing strong income growth of, no, of 300,000 pounds from the Roman baths and acknowledge that the new pricing policy introduced last year has achieved a nirvana, less visitors and more income. Well done to Stephen Bird and his staff, and they must be congratulated. Savings of 8.9 million were approved by the previous administration. Of these, 8 million are forecast to be delivered, but 0.8 million is entirely undeliverable, and in my view, should not have been included in the budget at the time. And I'll return to this in a moment. Positive, income, uh, positive outcomes are expected for council tax and business rate collection. These are set out in the report. It is essential that the chief executive and the management team focus hard on reining in expenditure over the next five months to ensure an improvement in the council's underlying revenue spending budget. Because the one-off um, benefit from uh, advantages in capital, uh, capital interest will not be repeated. So our underlying position still needs to be tackled. And I know the Chief Executive agrees with me and we have discussed this. Capital spending is forecast to be 34 million underspent and this is largely due to slippage on capital projects and rephasing. And I don't propose to go through that. The details are set out in the report. Finally, I want to turn to the former Modern Libraries proposals in respect of Bath Central Library, which is my most important announcement as part of this report. Now, Cabinet will recall that the previous administration proposed to combine the one-stop shop in Lewis House and the Bath Central Library into a single operation. It was proposed to borrow over three million pounds to fund that plan, with the borrowing costs of uh, costing the council and the service, because that was where it was decided that the um, saving should be taken, of over one million pounds over 20 years. So it would have cost four million pounds to borrow the three million pounds required. To date, that project has already expended 350,000 pounds. Now, following a review I commissioned, uh, I am pleased to recommend to the Cabinet that this project be abandoned, because it was never viable or economically sound. The previous administration ploughed on with it, this ill-thought-through idea, where the finances simply did not stack up and where there was little public support for the project. Unfortunately, the abortive costs will have to revert into, the, into our revenue budget and will be met by drawdown from the capital financing reserve. Frankly, this was a tremendous waste of money and shows what can happen when you fail to listen to what the public is telling you. As far as the future for Bath Central Library is concerned, it is my hope we will be able to invest resources back into the library and announcements on that aspiration will be made as part of the 2021 budget next year. We have already spent £100,000 this year on improving air quality handling in the library and I hope we are able to invest more. So in conclusion, Madam Chair, I want to thank the officers who prepared this ever comprehensive report which is very timely, only just over four weeks after the quarter end. And, uh, and that's a, a credit to the finance team who have turned this important information around so quickly. I therefore move the recommendations set out in the report at paragraphs 2.1 to 2.8. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Samuel. <coughs> and thank you as well for the, the, the warnings and concerns that you have uh, shared um, on our financial uh, position, you know, indeed, the, much of the report does make for quite sober reading, um, and much of which is the re direct result of uh, national decisions. <coughs> However, on you know, uh, clearly, I'm delighted that uh, that you will be abandoning the library scheme. Um, I think you know it was quite clear the public did not support uh, that change. And I think that is a, a very sensible uh, thing for to be doing. And finally, I'd like to echo your congratulations to Heritage Services for their continued excellent work that they do. Um, so having said all of that, I'm very happy to, to second this report. And then I'll ask uh, Cabinet if they have any comments themselves they wish to make. In that case, then, um, do you have any final comments? 
Uh, then we will move to the vote. All those in favour of this report? Thank you. Uh, the next item is the Treasury Management Report for 2019 to 20, uh, 2020, sorry, quarter two performance report. Richard. Thank you, Chair. Um, <sighs> it even says on my papers, is there anybody who wishes to make an ad hoc contribution? Okay. Bye. Thank you. I'll be rather briefer. Um, so this is the regular report that Cabinet receives um, prepared in accordance with the SIPFA Code of Guidance, and it covers uh, the first six months of this financial year. And I'll just read out some highlights. Um, borrowings remain well within the prudential indicator limits that the Council has previously set. The credit rating is at AA, which is above the benchmark of A-. Uh, £61 million pounds is currently invested by the Council. The breakdown is at Appendix 2. And investments in money market funds have increased in the last quarter by £9.4 million, uh, due, in, uh, due largely to reinvestment of money that we have loaned at lower interest rates. Average rates of interest have crept up slightly during the year, uh, but all reported figures have been above the benchmark anyway. So, Chair, overall, Chair, the performance remains sound against, against the benchmarks, and I commend the report to the Cabinet uh, with the recommendations set out in 2.1 to 2.3. But I do have to amend uh, paragraph 2.3 uh, because the uh, decision has been taken to uh, postpone the next corporate scrutiny panel. Uh, so that the words in that 2.3, the words to uh, November 2019, be substituted with next scheduled meeting of. Thank you. So that amendment is, is duly noted. Is there, uh, do I have a second of this paper? Do you wish to speak? No, thanks, uh, Chair. Very comprehensive. Are there any other contributions from Cabinet? No? Uh, Councillor Samuel, do you wish to sum up? No. Okay. OK, we will move to swiftly to the vote. All those in favour of the recommendations? So that's unanimous. OK. Right, item 14, which is the LGA Peer Review Action Plan. Does anybody have any ad hoc contributions to make? Would you like to make an ad hoc contribution? Can I do that? You may do that. So for those that you, uh, are not aware, this is our new Chief Executive, um, Will Godfrey, who uh, would like to make a few words, or say a few words. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to, I guess, as uh, somebody you know, coming into the organisation, reflect on the fact that I think these processes are really important to get, um, to get some external perspective on on how the organisation is is performing, and there's some really strong positive messages in it. Um, clearly, there are some challenges, which I think are really around sort of organisational discipline, around performance frameworks, around the medium-term financial plan. Um, and from my perspective, those are the issues that certainly I will be concentrating on in my early months in tenure, because I think getting those things right and having that better organisational discipline is pretty crucial to um, to the ongoing operation of the organisation. So for me, it's a really helpful uh, starting point to give some guidance. And certainly, I know it's something that the organisation embraced positively. Um, and I hope that we'll see some significant um, progress towards that action plan over the next few months. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Godfrey. Um, OK, so I'm very pleased that this report is before Cabinet this evening. And slightly oddly, I was quite pleased to have had the opportunity to have this review so early on in our administration. Obviously, there may be some who may not have welcomed this at that point. But I think for, for me and for us, it's given us a really great opportunity, a great chance to set a baseline from which we are able to develop and build our commitments to residents. You know, and uh, so just to remind people that includes better engagement with residents, uh, embedding you know, climate emergency within all our decisions, a focus on prevention amongst many, many other uh, manifesto commitments. 
I mean, this is clearly a plan that needs um, a proper buy-in from officers, from the chief executive down, and also from um, not just us as an administration, but also from all of us who are elected members uh, to this council as well. And I think what was um, really, I guess, reassuring to have seen within uh, the work that was carried out by the LGA peer review team, that they recognised the, the, you know, the real strengths that we have in this council. Um, yes, there were, there were issues that we will need to, to, uh, to address. You know, one of those, as um, Robin Kerr uh, highlighted earlier, is uh, developing a real vision for, for Bath, for the city of Bath, but obviously not letting um, one part of the authority sort of bec become greater than the other. So it's always about um, delivering that, that balance. Um, so, and finally, I'd just like to thank all of those that were on the LGA team for their time and commitment to assessing us and our, our needs. Uh, I think it's noted in the report that the amount of time and, uh, that they put in was the equivalent of one person spending eight weeks um, in our authority. So I think they should be uh, commended for, for that. Um, and on that note, I'd like to move this, uh, the recommendations, um, particularly uh, the, the one that invites the LGA peer review team to come back for a follow-up visit in summer of 2020 to review progress. So I, I move this and I uh, ask for someone to second. Councillor Crossley. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I think... Sorry. I'll start again. I think the LGA process is something when it started off uh, a decade and a half ago, it was met with a bit of uh, cynicism, but since it's become so established with peer reviews uh, and, and has become uh, a, a real part of local government, uh, and it's a, I think it's a great uh, matter of something that we should be proud of as a council that, that many uh, Baines councillors actually become peer reviews and, and work in reviewing other councils. So that, uh, that cross-fertilisation between councils, between uh, councillors of different uh, political persuasion, between uh, officers uh, of different council types has only been helpful in improving local government generally across the country. Um, and I think this uh, shows that uh, actually, uh, as part of the journey this council has run, it's actually a, 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 a reflection of credit on all councillors over the whole period of, of uh, our, our existence as Bath and North East Somerset Council, that we have uh, worked uh, to improve things. The bit I would really like to put a, a mention about is the engagement with the third sector community leaders. And in my portfolio, uh, what I have been uh, uh, amazed at is just the breadth and scope and depth of friends groups and volunteer groups that happens in Bath and North East Somerset. Now, I don't know if the level of volunteering and community engagement is a feature of life everywhere in, in the UK, but it is certainly a very large part of what happens in Bath and North East Somerset. And I think it's also in no small measure part of why this is such a, a good place and a positive place uh, to live uh, and be. So it's interesting that, that in, the, in the paragraph it just picks out one, the Wombles. But uh, litter picking is something that goes on in a variety of ways uh, across the whole of our authority area. And it, and it shows that we actually want to uh, live in a tidy community place. So as uh, the uh, cabinet member for, for uh, um, community, uh, one of the things that I've asked for is if uh, we can start developing or looking at the idea of having something equivalent to a parish charter, i.e. it would be a community group charter, so it would lay out uh, responsibilities on both sides so that we could see what happens. And a, a classic example of that might be a, an early one would perhaps be the Friends of of um, Henrietta Park, the park, where they do a lot of tremendous amount of work. And the relationship with our parks is something that I want to make sure happens uh, positively, is engaged constructively, and is something that we can roll out across all these volunteer groups in such a wide range of issues. So I think the rest of the recommendations uh, are self-evident. I just wanted to explore a bit further that one with the, the community leadership. Uh, and so I'm more than happy to second uh, this report. 
Uh, Councillor Samuel. Thank you, Chair. Um, I've, met, I've read many of these reports over the years, uh, and this is a good report, and this council can be proud to receive it. Uh, what this is essentially saying is that this is a well-run council. There are, of course, uh, as in any organization, things that could be done better uh, and things that we can improve on. Um, and, but by and large, this, re uh, this, excuse me, this report is saying good things. Um, I notice there's quite a lot of um, uh, matters to follow up that are down to the council leader and myself to follow through on, and we will. Uh, and one of those I particularly want to highlight is the need to make very strong connections between the aspirations we have for the communities we represent, the money that is available to fulfill those aspirations, and the timing and delivery of those aspirations. Um, our report card will be read in three, year, three and a half years' time by the electorate, and it is for them to decide whether we have met the aspirations we've set for ourselves. Um, one of the things I would like to say is that uh, and th this work is carrying on at the moment. It is always difficult when a council changes control from one uh, party to another uh, because aspirations for the council have to be reset, uh, at least in part, but we ought to remember as well that many things just carry on irrespective of the political control of a council because they are the day-to-day -day services residents receive uh, all the time. So, Chair, I, I, I welcome this report. I think it is a good starting point. There is more to do. I certainly hope we will have completed what we are, what we are asked to do well ahead of two years. Um, I hope that by the time the budget is presented to council in February, uh, we will be there in terms of the new community strategy for the area and that there is a very strong and close alignment between those pieces of work. So, Chair, I, su I support this report and I welcome it. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Any other speakers? So, you've missed your opportunity, I'm afraid. Okay. I'm very kind of you. I just want to understand. Somehow, somehow, the power of your argument seems to win. One day you'll be my age. Um, just a couple of points, though. I think recommendation three about the vision for Bath is extremely important, and I'm very glad to hear that you're going to be taking it on and moving this forward. Uh, of course, I'm rather smug because Westfield has a neighbourhood plan. And I would hope that you would encourage other areas to do a neighbourhood plan too, because it does draw out the community vision. But yeah, full marks there. Secondly, from the parish liaison committee, the point arose that fix my street is not working properly. And that's a very important method of communication with residents. So if that could be looked in, I'd be great looked into, I'd be grateful. And finally, I'm looking forward to a Will's Wanderings, the blog of the CEO. I hope we're going to have a blog, uh, as we have from the two previous CEOs. Well, my apologies for the delay in asking you to speak, but clearly it was well worth um, that. Um, and thank you for the plug for, for Westfield. Always look forward to how you're going to fit that in. Um, Councillor Butters. Thank you, Chair. Just to pick up the Fix My Street issue, this has been recognised and has been worked on currently, so we hope before too long to get back to you with some good news. Thank you. Okay. So, I would now like just to, uh, just to sum up. Um, so, the action plan will be... Um, published more obviously on our on our website so it's always you know it's been very good to have had that uh, sort of outside of view that this is a well-run council um, and uh, Councillor Salmon is absolutely right you know we need to make sure that our aspirations uh, you know tie in with the availability of the resources as you know we need to make sure that our timing of delivery um, is is useful and meaningful as well um, on that. Um, so I'd like to move to the vote. All those in favour of supporting this? That's unanimous. Thank you.
Okay, and now we move on to item 15, which is the homelessness and rough sleeping strategy for 2019 to 2024. Um, so I'd like to move to Council... I would not like to move to Councillor Ball. I'd like to ask if there's any ad hoc contributions. Eleanor? No, I'm just checking in case you become invisible. Right. Councillor Ball. Thank you very much. I'll uh, answer what Eleanor may have, may have asked if she actually spoke this evening, so I know what I'm going to say is probably dear to her heart. This is a draft strategy at the moment. It's out for consultation and would have been returning to December Cabinet. will now come back, back in probably in January for endorsement after consultation process. It was also due to go to scrutiny on the 18th of November. That has been postponed, so hopefully it will get to the scrutiny panel to be looked at. If not, it will come to Cabinet and we will accept all remarks coming in anyway. It's a consultation, so anybody can actually comment on the process. To give you a few updates from comments that have been received, I will run through this a little bit now. Many people have spoken earlier, was very passionate about this in the past, about people living on waterways as an alternative to rough sleeping or forms of homelessness have been received. It's an area for investigation which has already been looked at and will be included in the updated action plan we're dealing with that particular issue. A query has been raised by an all-female specific one-stop advice support and training division along the lines of the Nelson Trust in Wiltshire and Gloucestershire. The provision of that service includes housing accommodation, prison in reach, employment and training, prevention of child sexual exploitation and sex working. A cross directorate housing community safety, equalities, children and families and multi-agency Voluntary sector offender management discussions are needed to look at the gaps such a service might fill, and if agreed that it would be of benefit, how financial resources may be found. The Nelson Trust receives funds from a range of national and local sources, and a similar approach will be needed were a similar approach be taken in Bath and North East Somerset. So that is up for debate as yet. The funding the 2020-2021 Rough Sleeping Service is yet to be confirmed, but assurance will recently be received that similar levels of funding can be expected. A business plan has been submitted to MHCLG setting out how this would be spent, and a response is expected imminently. Further underwriting of any services to ensure rough sleepers have somewhere to go at any point of the day is also being considered by MHCLG. So this is a information report for you this evening, which you're asked to note. Please, any council has comments, anybody out in the community has comments, please make them in the consultation at the moment, because that will shape the final report that actually comes back to Cabinet in, in January. I understand I'm, I'm purely moving we note the papers this evening. Thank you. Uh, I think, Kevin, you were going to second. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Yes, I'd like to second the report. I'd also like to reiterate the point that to encourage as many people as possible to take part in the review. Uh, I had um, the pleasure of uh, inspecting some of our statutory um, services for looking after homeless children within Baines on Monday. Uh, Harriet Bosnell, the Director of Health and Support for Curo, gave me a tour of three of her facilities. Uh, who are uh, They are constantly full. Uh, they, as I've stated, are a statutory responsibility for the council to provide and their budget has been fixed for several years now and they're working extremely hard under very uh, difficult circumstances looking after some of the most vulnerable children in our, in our borough. I'd also like to uh, note that um, sofa surfing, is, uh, particularly with young children, is something that's overlooked when it comes to homelessness. So I'd like that to be a uh, place in the report as well. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Councillor Samuel. Thank you, Chair. It's the mark of a civilised society that it can house all of its citizens in dry, safe and affordable housing. And one of the most Im I think this is one of the most important uh, services that the Council provides to the community in Bath and North East Somerset. It must be our aim to remove the scourge of homelessness, whether rough sleeping, which is obviously highly visible, or as Councillor Guy has said, sofa surface, the invisible homeless who have no permanent home to call their own. So 
I welcome this report, uh, giving us a, an update of where uh, our work has got to on this. I hope when the report finally comes before us um, in its final state, that our aspirations are ambitious. Um, nobody in 2019 should be without a roof over their head, and we must do everything we can to make sure that's the case in our borough. Thank you. Do I have any other speakers? No. I would just like to actually add, you know, looking at uh, the, the, the plan, the, the, um, the key priorities that have been highlighted, I think it is a really useful list of tasks to, to do, um, and hopefully it will identify what more we and our partners can do to ensure that nobody um, is without a roof over their, their heads in future. Um, so I'd uh, just like to ask Councillor Ball if you'd like to sum up. Okay. In which case then, uh, can we move to the vote? All those uh, in favour of noting this report. And the final item on the agenda today is uh, an update on council house building. Um, and so I'd like to ask uh, Councillor Ball. I would not like to ask Councillor Ball. I'd... One day I will actually remember to read my notes and I would like to ask for some ad hoc contributions. <laughs> In that case, Councillor Ball. I must be doing a wonderful job. No one wants to criticise it this evening. But let's um, look at the report in some detail if we can. This is a high-level report at the moment. A lot more detail will follow on in further council meetings and cabinet meetings. This report was due also to come to council next week. It's not now coming because we're in Perida. I think political decisions are not allowed whilst we're in the Perida process. So unfortunately, I cannot debate with colleagues what might have come to council. It will come to a future council meeting, and it will come in to a future cabinet meeting with much more detail on or what we're actually planning to do. It is very important that we ensure that all people have affordable homes to live in. Uh, the vision of council housing is something that actually leads us down that particular path to ensure good quality homes, carbon neutral wherever possible. I'm, I'm looking for nearly all of them. My, Sarah, my colleague Sarah is looking at me saying they all may be, but they will be as well as well possible, particularly on new built housing. And that's what we'll be looking to do is build new built houses, carbon neutral, as a council housing stock. So, not only they provide value for money to actually rent, they also provide value for money for families who will have lower energy bills in that particular process. The programme plan is set out in 3.7 to 3.10 of the report and actually gives you some issues of what we're actually going through and the actual workshop programme we've actually taken on that particular issue. So we will be coming through and bringing further information back to you in, in the near future. I think I will hold that particular point because, as I said, this is a briefing report for Cabinet at the moment, and the more detail will follow later. I'll move without that report. Thank you, Councillor Ball. Uh, do I have somebody to second uh, this proposal? Yeah, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, I've got no hesitation in uh, seconding this. I mean, uh, there are tens of thousands of people um, around the country that aspire to have a roof over their head for that security. And mm. the fact that it actually impacts quite significantly on their health and well-being, not only the individuals, the adults, but also the children and things like that. And Bath and North East Somerset are no different in having uh, a, a significant number of people that aspire to have, uh, as I said, this, this roof over their head. So on that basis, I have no hesitation in uh, seconding this motion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Appleyard. Uh, do I have any other speakers? Councillor Sam. Uh, well, I can't let this moment go, Chair. Um, I'm really pleased that this report has come forward. It shows that there is good progress being made in moving towards a very challenging 
objectives set for this council to start building council housing after a period of probably over 20 years uh, when none has been built because of the transfer of the stock. So this is, uh, the, when this finally comes forward in the new year, this will be a landmark moment, a big moment of change, and we need to recognize how big it is for the council. For those members who are interested in the history of council housing, uh, a very good book was written by a man called John Bolton. It's called Municipal Dreams, The Rise and Fall of Council Housing. And it is a really instructive um, journey through the early days of council house with heady ambitions to its ultimate decline in the 1980s because of lack of, un under, lack of investment and right through to the present day. And it's a very interesting read because it, it shows a lot about the ambition councillors had maybe 80 years ago for building council housing for their communities. I hope we can reignite that ambition because it is certainly one of the most important things, particularly, I think, in this Bath North East Somerset area because of the high costs of social housing uh, and access for people on lower incomes. And that, unfortunately, is something that has dropped off the national agenda uh, in recent years. So I really welcome this report. I was part of the workshop um, with others here uh, that was held about a month or so ago, and I felt that was a really productive session in terms of bringing our ideas together with officers and mapping out a clear pathway. So I, I really commend the work Councillor Ball is doing on this with officers, and I'm looking forward to the final product. Thank you, Councillor Samuel. Um, I've just realised that I probably ought to have declared uh, an interest, as I am the shareholder, uh, on, on ADL, um, which uh, is, is mentioned in uh, 3.10. I assume that that doesn't bar me from voting. Um, okay, in which case I take advice. Um, and uh, are there any other speakers? In which case I will move to the vote. Oh, sorry, would you like to sum up? Yes, well, this is the case, I would like to sum up. Can I thank colleagues for their support for this paper this evening? Um, I'd like to thank the Labour Party for support to previous council meeting regarding this issue and the independent group who have now previously left us. The sell off of council housing was come through the John Major Conservative Government from 92 to 97 when councils were forced to actually shift their housing out of stock. It's noticed in the last council meeting the Conservative group did not support the paper. I hope we can add enough excitement in the paper and forward thinking to bring them on board in the next few months. And that's what I intend to try and ensure we have a united council going forward to ensure we serve all our residents properly, particularly those who do not have the funding to pay the high rents or high mortgage costs to live in this area, because the actual workforce across this area needs a stable home to live in, a good home to live in, a good home to bring children up in. Let's unite the council properly and push this forward so we benefit all of our residents. Thank you, Councillor Ball. So now moving to the vote. All those in favour of the recommendation? It's not. Noting. Thank you. Um, I believe I've now reached the end of the agenda. In which case, then I would like to say thank you, everybody, for your attendance. And this is almost the, the shortest cabinet meeting that we have had. Um, and I wish everybody well until we meet again.